aiming for emotional accuracy when translating Psalms, thinking and feeling as does the poet. Emotional accuracy implies capturing the aesthetic beauty and the rhetorical power of the poem. The aesthetic beauty refers to the beautiful imagery and sound patterns which delight the senses. The rhetorical power refers to the persuasive force which moves the emotions. In this presentation, I want to just touch on four topics. Firstly, some key ideas in poetry, in poetry different from narrative, artistry, orality, and memorability. Secondly, looking at internalization, which I describe as thinking and feeling the poem, and then how to facilitate creativity and how to facilitate memory, both increasing the capacity for memory and the recall, the speed of retrieval. So the key ideas when translating a poem, the ones I want to focus on are firstly, orality, the fact that a poem must be heard. We have to hear the sounds. The sounds convey both the content and the emotion. And the sounds are especially selected for their poetic properties, things like assonance, alliteration, or sound play. The artistry of the poem refers to the poetic devices which serve aesthetic and rhetorical functions. First, we need to study the poetic devices used in the Hebrew text and see what function they are performing. Are they adding to the beauty? Are they part of the persuasive power? How do they do it? And then we need to find poetic devices in the receptor language which perform the same function. And these might be poetic devices that don't exist in Hebrew. For example, in, in Bounty languages, we have idiophones, which are very effective when used in translated poetry. Memorability, we want to increase the memorability of the poem. So ideas and words will need to be repeated. We might have to use full noun phrases instead of pronouns. The ideas will be specially arranged in particular structures to aid memory, things like chiasm, inclusio, or acrostic. Rhythm will be very helpful to aid memory. Rhythm serves many purposes. It adds to the aesthetics of the poem. It helps indicate the emotion of the poet, and it can highlight the emphasis in the poem. When the rhythm changes, you've had a steady rhythm and it suddenly changes, a shorter or a longer line, that's usually drawing attention to an important idea. Right, internalization, which I said is thinking and feeling as does the poet, is different to memorization. Memorization is the process of simply retaining words or ideas in memory. But in internalization, we actually enter into the mind and heart of the poet. Internalization stimulates creativity and analytical thought. Unlike memorization, internalization is concerned with creativity and analysis. For authentic translation of a psalm and for emotional accuracy of the poem, the translator needs to internalize the psalm. That is, to feel the poet's emotions and think as does the poet. Thinking like the poet involves understanding the content of the poem. This includes its historical context, its logic and structure, and its patterns of sound and poetic features. For example, metaphors. Metaphors extend the semantic content. So thinking the psalm involves remembering the key ideas and the themes the logical relationship between these key ideas, the divisions, the stanzas in the poem, the moods and how they change, and the poetic devices. Where they occur can often, where they congregate can often tell us that's the high points of the poem. 
where there's an accumulation of poetic devices. Feeling the sob, we need to listen to the sound patterns and to the prosody. And prosody includes things like meter, rhythm, rhyme, stress. As both sound patterns and prosody convey emotion of the speaker and the evoke emotion in the hearer. Prosody evokes four basic emotions, which are happiness, sadness, and anger, anxiety. The speed at which the speech is spoken will indicate either happiness or sadness. A fast or a medium speed indicates a happy tone, a slow speed indicates a slow tone. The rhythm, if it's regular, indicates a stable emotion, such as happiness or sadness, whereas an irregular rhythm tends to indicate anxiety or anger. If the pitch is rising, that tends to be associated with anger or anxiety, a low pitch suggests sadness. The meter, which is the number of lines in a verse, if it's regular meter, it makes the poem easy to understand and to remember. Rhyme between adjacent lines or words as an alliteration and assonance suggests an upbeat, upbeat mood, as in happiness. It could also suggest anger or anxiety. A longer interval between rhymes elicits a slower pace and so suggests sadness. Right, we need to try and facilitate creativity because the translator needs a lot of creativity to choose appropriate metaphors, to include sound features of his or her language, which have the same function as those in the Hebrew text. The translator needs to imagine the emotions of the poets and to use prosody. When he's presenting the poem, he needs to use nonverbal elements such as stress and tone and intonation and so on in order to convey the correct emotions. So there's a great amount of creativity that the translator needs to show. So how do we stimulate creativity? Should the person work alone or in groups? This is the first matter to think about. Working alone or in groups, the first thing we need to do is generate as many ideas as possible. We call that green lighting. And group work is often most productive for this tip. One person often triggers ideas in another, but individual thinking is also very productive as it allows a person time to process the idea to completion without interruption. Once ideas have been generated, they must be evaluated and then the best will be selected to be used. It's generally suggested to use a hybrid process, including both people thinking alone and sharing in groups. Either start with thinking alone and then in groups or vice versa, and if time permits, repeat the process. To help think and feel the poem, the aim is to hold in short-term memory the key ideas and emotions conveyed in each stanza so that the translation that emerges is natural and culturally sensitive. The translator is not going from one word or one idea to the next, but has absorbed the whole poem, has internalized the poem, big picture and details, and is now able to express the poem in its own language in a natural way. We need to try and make sure that the poem can easily be remembered. People quickly forget words and syntax, syntax, but if we choose the words carefully and we choose sound patterns and arrange these patterns in ways like chiasm and clusio, and if we choose carefully the prosody that we use to communicate the poem, the text will become much more memorable. First, let's think about the brain activity when retrieving memories. The right brain intuitively comprehends the poem in its entirety. 
So one has to see the big picture of the poem before analyzing it. That's why we have to keep reading the whole poem over and over again to absorb the big picture. It's not like a story, a narrative going sequentially. So once we have the poem in its entirety absorbed into our being in terms of the way the poet is thinking and feeling, the left brain will then analyze and apply abstract thinking. And third, the right brain will integrate all these impressions into a complex whole. The new memories are encoded in the hippocampus and then transferred to the frontal lobes for long-term storage. This is a very complex process, involves many neural connections. And so retrieving older memories requires stronger associations and increased effort. So we try to uh, um, store the memories in short-term verbal memory where they can be um, accessed much more easily. We also need to be aware of body memory or physiological memory. The body is able to associate particular movements with particular ideas. So speaking words and making meaningful gestures at the same time imprints the ideas more strongly in memory. Specific movements have been found to correlate with the way we feel and with what we recall. It's very culture specific, but in some cultures, light movements and open body positions, palms upward while sitting in a resting position or in an upright posture or nodding one's head are associated with positive feelings. So in other cultures, strong movements, closed body positions may recall negative emotions. It's worth exploring the, in the community you work with if they have some understanding of how movement and emotion relate to one another. Short-term verbal memory has three components. The capacity, how many items can be held in short-term verbal memory at a time, the average is seven, plus or minus two, and they can only be held for 15 to 30 seconds, and sometimes for less time than that, if there are interruptions or delays. The memory will be encoded using different methods, and repetition is one of the ways. Right, now I'm going to go through a number of ways that we can increase the memory capacity and the recall speed. And the first one is that actions can help us remember material. Gestures, miming the action, jotting down keywords, the actual action of writing is helpful, as is explaining, speaking to one another, telling others what you're doing and what you're feeling. Experiencing the emotions of the poet in one's body or face assists with memory. And expressing emotion is also very helpful. It, it's associated with creativity and artistic performance. Another way to increase memory capacity and recall is to use rhythm. It helps the person remember a sequence of items and accuracy of recalling an item depends on its position in the sequence. They found that if you add a pause after every third item, it assists with memory. The more senses that are activated by an experience, the better it will be remembered. So it's helpful to try to associate smells, tastes, textures, pictures, and other sounds, not just the sound of the voice, with the ideas in each stanza of the song. Personal connection amplifies memory. So participants should be encouraged to discuss the key idea in each stanza and why it is important to them. For example, Psalm 55 has the idea of being betrayed by someone close to you. You could ask them, have you ever been through an experience like that? 
Would you like to share it with your partner, with someone? Or would you like to write a short poem and just express how it felt? But just by having that personal association, that personal connection will strengthen the memory of that idea that comes from Psalm 55 as they're trying to process the song. Music, music is very helpful, both listening to music or performing music, activates memory, attention, and if possible, it's very helpful to convert the key ideas into a song, which has a melody, chant, has rhythm, but both a song and a chant can be very helpful in increasing memory capacity. Number eight, the poem needs to be read aloud many, many times, and we need to learn to listen to the content, listen to the mood, the intonation pattern, notice where there are pauses, listen to the rhythm, see if there are changes in the rhythm. Number nine, performing the poem is very helpful. I find it's relatively easy to adjust a Psalms text to look like a play script, and after a few times of following the script, participants might be able to enact the poem using their own words and sometimes even their own language. Here we have a group acting out Psalm 23, verse 5. You prepare a table before me. And the COPS team in South Africa, for them, the best table that could be prepared would be a, a bright place with the sheep on the spit. And so here one of the participants is acting out the sheep on the spit. It's a little bit over the top. They had a lot of fun and they would remember that idea in Psalm 23. If possible, you also enact the backstory, not just the psalm, but also what was going on at the time that the psalmist wrote the psalm. So for Psalm 62, I wrote a script based on 2 Samuel 22 to 24. And it was a long text and a long drama, but it really helped the participants see how David and his men were continually running from one cave to another, trying to escape Saul. And that helped them understand David's emotional state and that of his men as he wrote Psalm 62. The anxiety, the exhaustion, the fear continually there. You may need to draw on other texts to give a fuller picture of the emotional state of the poet at the time of writing the psalm. Number 11, you might want to enact a modern situation which provokes the same emotions as those in the psalm. Psalm 93, 3 and 4, that speaks of the waves rising up and the growing fear of this great problem, this great difficulty. So that could be enacted with participants in the boats being overwhelmed by the waves, using the metaphor as appears in Psalm 93, verse 3. Or you could change the metaphor, and it could be a fire that's coming closer and closer to one's home. Verse 3 and 4 both have tricola with increasing intensity. And so you could have the fire is at the edge of the village, and now it's at the edge of your homestead, and now it's entered your house and you can feel it. And listen to the cries that they would call out. To whom would they cry? What would they say? What kind of emotion are they able to express? What kind of idiophones would be used in situations like that? You might find it helpful to devise an acronym to remember key ideas or features of the poem. In Psalm 93, the verses forming the frame, verses one, two, and five, I used the acronym BEST, B-E-S-T, to help participants remember four different characteristic, characteristics of the deliverer in those verses. In other Psalms, you might want to enact an attribute, such as in Psalm 131, arrogance. Participants can be asked to walk like a proud person or put an arrogant expression on the face or enact a situation where a person demonstrates an attitude of arrogance. Creating an emotional map is very helpful, especially when the mood's swinging a lot as you get in laments. As the participants listen to the psalm being read aloud, others show on their faces and in their body, in their body language, the emotions apparent. 
in what the poets are saying. And after several repeats, the participants can go through the sequence of emotions without any words being read. Try and engage not only words, but you might want to describe the emotions through colors. And as you go through the poem, what color would you use in this part of the poem? Or what shape? Would it be a jarring shape, a smooth shape, a regular shape? Or you could ask them to use drawings and key ideas to capture the main ideas in each stanza. Or they could use gestures. Different groups could work with different stanzas and work out the gestures for each stanza and then teach those gestures to one another. So Psalm 131. They did it extremely well. First they used the words, they associated the words with the actions and then they were able to go through the whole psalm just using actions and they could remember it perfectly. Keywords, people can listen to the psalm being read and jot down a few keywords for each stanza and then together in groups they share their words and try and build up as much of that stanza as they can remember. Number 18, sometimes it's helpful to compose one's own poem for a short section of the rhetoric as in Psalm 93, that one about the waves increasing could change the metaphor. In Psalm 131, you could ask the people to write a lullaby, giving advice to the child, as in the psalm, and encourage sharing of creative efforts if people free, feel free to do so. We found people love to share, and we've got some wonderful, wonderfully creative ideas. And lastly, the idea of stations is when we have a combination of pictures, key ideas, gestures, props, and so on. In Psalm 62, I had 17 stations, which were 17 chairs around the room in order. And each station was associated with a particular part of the psalm, a particular idea. So in Psalm 62, verse 1, the, part, the psalmist says, Lord, you are my rescue, you are my rest. I will not be greatly shaken. So for the idea of rest, I had a pillow as a prop. For the idea of rescue, I had a rope, imagining someone pulling up someone who's fallen down a cliff. And then for I will not be greatly shaken, I had written the word abalada, which is to be shaken in their language, and then a cross through it. And then we also associated a gesture where they shook their bodies and said, no. So by associating pictures, ideas, gestures, props with particular biblical texts, it helps them to remember. The facilitator first goes round all the stations. At each station, someone reads the biblical text, and then the facilitator helps the participants see how these pictures, ideas, gestures, props fit in with this key idea, fit in with this important idea at the station in the biblical text. Then they go around in pairs, and try and help one another remember what happens at each station. And then finally, they will write in other in pairs or alone, write as much of the poem as they can remember. They love doing it and it seems to work quite well. So translating poems with emotional accuracy is engaging, enlightening and enjoyable. Give it a go. Thank you.